clearly to be able to articulate what um, is special about your initiative. Um, so that is um, some good some good stuff about um, the why why the market will accept um, accept your initiative, um, why it will pay for your initiative, um, and, and actually try to prove that the market will pay for your initiative. Um, and um, and that's quite difficult for New Zealanders um, because New Zealanders are great inventors and initiators, and they're the worst marketers in the world. Uh, when you are raising money. Um, always um, believe that it is difficult to go to the well twice. So identify how much money you need for your project um, and maybe add a percentage on to that, um, be it 25% uh, or 50%, because things will go wrong and money will get spent um, and there will be some learnings along the way. So it will be a bumpy ride. So make sure that you're asking for enough money or when you're putting the, pro the, the finance together. Um, if you don't and you have to go back and ask for more money, it is really, really difficult. So when someone's going to invest in, um, some money in, in your project, um, then they're going to want to know what you're going to spend it on. So, um, sorry, no overseas holidays um, or um, um, jaunts or anything like that. Um, you'll be out the door pretty quick. Um, so be very careful to articulate exactly what you're going to spend it on. The thing that, that people underestimate, um, certainly if they don't have a financial background, is, um, is the cash, um, guarding the cash. So what influences the cash? So uh, the cash can get impacted by um, stock, for instance, and so they talk about things about stock turns. Retailers know all about stock turns and turning stock over and off the, off the shelves so many times a year, etc. Um, or ages of, um, of debtors, so how quickly your debtors. So uh, the key performance indicators in, in financial terms, that's all you need to, to know. What are your five key performance indicators for your project? You need to understand them, you need to have the discipline around measuring them, um, and that will run your business. The detail around your budgeting going forward in three to five years out, and or even on monthly uh, projections around your project is really, really important. So um, the key of the budget will then indicate and, and drop into how much cash you're going to need through those various intervals of um, start-up, uh, through then um, your business starting to get and, and get some momentum, and then your business starting to grow. And there'll be three phases in that, so you'll burn cash at different stages. Um, but, but I'm sorry, uh, no shortcuts. Um, you'll need to run out your budgets. Uh, again, you'll need to have very, very good assumptions around it. So what are the things that you can easily knock off about predicting um, things in financial terms? Um, you can, can predict your costs, all right? So that should be a walk in the park. You should be able to predict your costs. Um, you should be able to predict your margin, your profit margins on whatever you're offering, be it a product or be it a service offering. Um, because um, um, you would have done, I would suspect, a certain amount of um, uh, from this program, uh, good market testing uh, and market planning uh, around what your product can enter the market at and at what price. So therefore that should give you your profit margin. The hardest thing is going to be the top line. It's going to be the sales line. So what work can you do? What theory can you apply? What research can you do? Uh, what mechanisms can you engage um, to help you to take out the risk around the top line? It is all about the revenue line. That's the guess. New Zealanders are not good at the top line because we're not good marketers. And so we don't do the work. Um, so um, perhaps you go and talk to media companies. Um, they have research data um, that's coming out all the time. They're acting for clients, they're doing um, market and, and retail research for all those people. Perhaps you can kid them into a coffee and, um, hey, I need a hand. Um, and if I'm able to launch this business, then I promise I'll come back and place my business with you. Um, so that's kind of like success fee negotiation with marketing and media companies to, uh, to give you that information. Um, some of that might be um, also associated with um, other professionals you can rope in to help you. Um, and people like to help people. Professionals and um, successful um, businesses like to help other people. So don't be scared to ask them. Um, but but um, uh, I might add, be loyal to them. If they give you something, 
then go back and, um, and, and tell them what you've done. If you can go back and give them some business because they've invested in you, great. Um, I have a bias because I was a b and I was with KPMG. So they're a big company and they have a brand reputation on being thorough, good, conservative, quality, you know, all that sort of good stuff. Um, as opposed to an H&R block, we used to call them corner shop, shop um, accountants that um, may be also rands. So it's putting um, some, some good quality professionals around you when you can um, and when you can afford them, um, if not on a success fee basis. And the same with, um, with the lawyers, um, a little bit more um, um, stretch in, in, in brands around lawyers, um, some marketing assistance and, uh, that I've just talked about. Um, and even um, if you are going and, and you're into the next phase in, in your business growth where you need more money, you need some equity, and you go out there and start banging the doors down, um, you will find them hard to bang down. So using uh, people that are specialists in those sorts of areas um, like equity brokers who know the people um, that are going to invest, they know what they want to see, they know the questions they're going to ask. Go and get some um, experts around you. Yeah, you've got to pay them. Yes, it's going to be on success, and you might think it's a lot of money, but your percentage of, um, uh, of winning, um, of getting that money, uh, will go up a lot. So, so the avenue to the money is more limited than what you think. You hear people saying they've got lots of money to invest. Well, who are they? You don't know who they are, but the professionals do. Um, a financial advisor, the accounting fraternity will know who they are, uh, maybe not so much the legal fraternity unless they've got a commercial focus, but the accounting fraternity definitely will. Um, some of the um, uh, New Zealand Trade and Enterprise, for instance, they'll have um, knowledge of those people and some leads into it. Successful business um, is all about sales up, costs down, isn't it? That's all you need to think about. Um, in financial terms for your business to be successful, pretty simple. Um, so, um, so you've got to measure that. So, um, zero, you know, free advertising for zero here. Um, but look, it's it's a it's a it's a good system. It um, it integrates uh, probably with most of the accountants um, that uh, might want to take your numbers to a higher level of um, analysis um, for you. Um, normally, people's competency will be pretty good. Um, the people that you assess uh, around what you what you actually want around you, um, so you, you know you can figure that out pretty easy. The harder ones is the is the trust and the, and the loyalty that you want with uh, those early startup people um, around you, because they'll work really hard, and if they've got those attributes, then off they go. And and the other thing um, that is really important around the uh, people selection is, don't get the people that tell you why you can't do it. You want to get the people that can tell you how you can do it because they'll hold you up. They will hold you up. And, you, and if you're a young entrepreneur, that's not what you want to do. You want smart people that can tell you how you can do it. So you'll hit lots of barriers. You'll hit lots of troughs and things like that. So what are we going to do? How, how can we do it? So those are the two things, I think. Um, trust and loyalty um, and um, get people around you that can tell you how you can do it. And people... Um, in business um, and who have been successful, they love helping people. They really do. So it's just knowing where to, where to find some of those people. Um, so um, some of the angel um, operators, angel investor operators, uh, will have access to some names. Um, the Ice House have access to some names. NZTE have access to some and, and sometimes you don't need to pay them. You don't need to pay them at the outset, so uh, maybe you can agree that, okay, come and give us a hand, um, and, and they will, and uh, look, if it gets to this step, um, where uh, we're starting to get some momentum, we're getting some money, and we can start to pay a little bit of money then, and we get to another step, and, and they'll go for the ride with you. When you're going and talking to banks, and you're going and talking to equity investors, and you're going you know, on all those other steps, it helps. It helps with your personal credibility around your project. Uh, you've got to be able to articulate your vision. Um, it's not just an idea that you, you're going to try and raise money on. You've actually got to you've got to identify what is the I guess the gap in the market that you are you are your solution fills. Um, that's probably the, the first sort of stage. Is you know what is the, what is the problem that you're actually setting out to try and solve. The team is so, so important to the success of any early stage venture. I mean, it's not 
not just having the solution to the problem that you've identified, but uh, often an investor, and let's face it, those investors have lots and lots of ideas that they're looking at, uh, and uh, minimum, I guess, sort of uh, resources to, uh, to invest. Time and time again, I see the, the investor really honing in on the quality of the team, the passion of the team, and the way that team connect. Um, you know, in my experience, there's, there's a lot of ideas that come along that actually get discounted at quite an early stage, but the team still stays intact and the investor will invest in the team. And it may be the second or maybe the third or even the fourth idea that is that real commercial success. But you know, the investor has invested in those people. Um, I guess the, the first potential area of, of, uh, of funding is what we call the three Fs, the friends, the family, the fools. Um, you know, those people that are nearest and dearest to the, the entrepreneur the, or the, the, the initial founders who, you know, believe in, again, that, that particular person or group of people and hopefully get an understanding of what the idea is that they're, that they're trying to take to market. Um, often this can be, you know, family members, um, you know, friends, um, fools maybe aren't the best investors in, in, these, uh, in these companies, but that's... As the, as the saying goes, friends, family and fools. Um, but all of those investors need to understand what they're getting into at, a, at an early stage. Um, and the, inv the founder needs to understand, uh, and it's very, very important, that you, know, you can't take your money in on a ridiculously high valuation because then when the real investors come in at, at some future stage, you know, your initial investors are, 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 are gonna get screwed on, on valuation. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a common sense approach, but um, yeah, you've got to have people that believe in you who are willing to, to write you know, a check to, uh, to get you started. Once the, once the, the, the business has evolved, um, hopefully some, some market validation, maybe we can talk about that uh, a little later. Um, angel investors, investors are, uh, are a group that certainly would be uh, interested in early stage investment, and angels are, I guess, those those investors that want to come along and, and, and take a, a punt, an educated punt at an early stage. And their premise is, you know, they might invest in 30 different companies. And of those 30, they want one to be the next Facebook or the next Google or the next Trade Me. You know, they might have one or two that, uh, you know, a reasonably sort of average return, a um, couple that might even break even. And the majority of them will, they'll lose their money. But it's those absolute outliers, you know, those those Googles and that that uh, that give them multiple returns on their their money that just keeps them coming back and, and wanting to to invest. I think very much so. I mean, we we're we we're a country of, of four four million people. You know, it's very very difficult to to create a business and and get rich selling to four million people. Um, typically, the businesses that I work with initially start off in New Zealand, that's where typically the, uh, the entrepreneurs are. They validate or they get some sort of proof point that what they've actually created is, is attractive to a market. And New Zealand is, is effectively a, a test market. Um, you know, New Zealand is actually a great way to take an idea through a, you know, a reasonably uh, small country and reasonable small number of population and get real sort of um, firm and accurate data on what does and, and doesn't work. Um, look, you can, you can screw up in New Zealand and that you don't lose your shirt. You screw up in the US and, and all the investment that you've made in those overseas markets and you know, it can be the end of you. And a lot of the, uh, the early stage investors, the angels, will have a pre-described, pre, um, I guess, uh, set of criteria that they will want an entrepreneur to follow through before they'd even give it any consideration. In a lot of the cases, that might be you've got to make a hundred phone calls to a hundred potential customers, and, and give us the feedback. And if ninety-nine of them say no, I wouldn't want, I wouldn't buy it, then yeah, you probably should think of another idea. And I guess you know, from a financial perspective, um, we we focus on the not just the capital structure of, of a company, but on the the financial forecast that, that form a big part of uh, of the business plan. There are some amazing tools in the cloud. Um, there's a great uh, company here in New Zealand called Spotlight um, who have a three-way forecast, so that's um, cash flow, balance sheet and profit and loss forecasting all in, in a SaaS delivery. Um, all links beautifully into um, a zero accounting and uh, I mean any, any assumptions 
are absolutely key to the success of a uh, of a financial model. Um, but certainly, what We've moved a long, long away, f way away from from Excel spreadsheets and and and, and complex models. And um, yeah, in, in my pers personal view, keep it quite simple. You can get lost in the assumptions, and and you can you can almost get sucked in to believe in your assumptions. If you can actually bring those assumptions right to the forefront of any business plan, any modelling, you can very, very uh, quickly sanity check those to see whether you're on the right thing. And and that's ultimately what any of the investors will, uh, will want to look at. You can raise too much money. Um, and let's not forget if you raise too much money too soon, you're giving away more of the company um, sooner than you ideally would like to or would need to. And if you can grow the business, you can hopefully also grow the valuation of the business. So when you do actually raise more money, you're, you're giving away less of the business. Um, having said that, uh, a lot of the early stage companies that I get involved with are raising money almost too frequently. And that comes down, I guess, to the, the accuracy or the, the believability of, uh, of their financial models. Because you cannot underestimate the amount of time, the distraction from the business, raising capital takes. I mean, it's effectively a full-time job for a CEO to raise money. And if you're doing that every six months, you know, you, when do you actually have the time to actually run the business and, and grow the business? You know, almost every company I work with is forecasting to run out of money because that's uh, that's how they that's how they grow. The angel the angel groups in New Zealand have evolved a lot in recent years. It used to be quite sort of geographically spread out throughout New Zealand, um, and almost a little sort of bit protectionist as to, hey, we want to do the deal with Auckland, we don't want to do the deal with the Nelson Angels, for example. Uh, but there's a lot more collaboration now, which is, which is fantastic for the angel group, but even more um, you know, advantageous for the, uh, the prospective investors and, and, and entrepreneurs as well. Um, you know, it might be that cause often when angels put money into to companies, almost always, they want a seat on the board or on the advisory board. And it may, by, by tapping into the whole angel network in New Zealand, you may well find that the particular industry expert for your company might be an angel investor in Nelson. Um, you might raise the majority of your money in, in Auckland or Wellington or Tauranga, but the one particular person that you really want to, uh, to sit on your board and open doors as you, as you expand globally may not be. Good question. I'd like to think, uh, so I'm, I'm a nice angel myself and Ice Angel is the, uh, the angel group here in, uh, in Auckland. Um, you know, it is just as easy as to send an email to, uh, to the Ice Angels from their website, pick up the phone or give them a call. Uh, one of the angel groups here in, uh, in Auckland has what they call an angelic drop-in, um, an ADI, um, I think you know, a certain day every, every month and anybody can just freely walk into their office have a conversation, hey, I've got this idea, what do you think? Um, in a lot of cases, it's just a, 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 an opportunity to just talk through your business. And the angel on the other side, um, again, very, very sort of informal. You know, these guys love to help new businesses and young, young entrepreneurs. And hey, look, if they can uncover the nugget of an investment opportunity, then that's great for them as well. The, the, the world has changed a lot since uh, the idea of you had to you know, get your software and download it on your computer and then you had to go out and buy another floppy disk and all that. All there's some amazing tools available here in the cloud. I mean, Xero is a, Xero is a great New Zealand company. Um, I've used Xero for many, many years. Uh, I would say 90% of the companies that I work with here in New Zealand use, use Xero. Um, it's, just an, it's just a great system in terms of of, um, I guess, making accounting reasonably straightforward, but it's 24-7 it's, and it's access from anywhere. I mean, hey, there were a lot of entrepreneurs that, uh, that set up those business and, and luckily or fortunately connect with socially minded investors as well. Um, you know, and there might, be, you know, there might be room in an investor's portfolio to invest in, in that type of, of business. Typically, I see those sorts of companies talking more to government and trying to get government funding uh, rather than, uh, than commercial funding. We never saw anything up there that we thought was better than or even as good as some of the ideas we've seen here. So we think our 
main problems are capital and commercialising. Um, it's, we don't have a creativity problem. You know, a lot of the ideas we saw in Israel were almost 10 years old compared to stuff I've seen here. So, you know, fascinating visit and I'd certainly encourage anyone uh, who can to go there at some point. What often happens is that people create fantastic ideas and yet need some real guidance around the frameworks that are needed to actually implement those ideas. So this is why a course like this is very exciting and uh, you know, can provide right guidance to people to implement a concept into a successful business venture. When you're setting up in business, there's one thing you absolutely need beyond that good idea of a product or service, and that's cash flow. And we all understand cash flow, and yet, in my experience, too often, business owners are so tied up in creating the excitement that they forget to fill up the tank of their car. And so they wonder why they're going nowhere, or they get into trouble, uh, and that's because the, the cash flows run out, or they don't have a full understanding of the fuel gauge and when that cash flow is going to run out. Um, so they're under a panic and running around scrambling trying to get money in the door. So there is no need for that. Um, everyone knows about money in, money out, and the complexities of a business are no more complex than that that you need money in, where are you going to get it from? At the startup phase, it's likely to be your own savings and family and friends that you're begging and borrowing money to, for them to provide. And that's great. When you grow beyond that, then you're going to be looking for angel investors. And that brings in a little bit more complexity. The balance then is, how much are you prepared to give away of what potentially is a huge future for you to actually fund something and could you do it a different way? So there are those questions that you need to be asking and the key really is ask them up front. Know how much money you need to live off while you set up this perfect idea. Can you do it part time while you're still working and that provides funding for you? Uh, don't just do this huge leap of faith of thinking, you know, if I make this decision, the universe will look after me. It won't. It might, if you're lucky, you might have a lucky lotto win, but the odds are about the same as that. The key really is, be responsible. How much money do you need, and how are you going to get it? And do everything at least three months in advance, and I know um, you know, at the startup phase, that's quite difficult, but don't spend money that you don't have. There's, at the startup phase, I'd be doing it myself. Um, you, you need to attract some goodwill friend who's got some accounting knowledge who can actually make sure it's been done correctly. But to go out and buy a system at the very beginning could be more money than you could afford, and you'd be better off to spend money exploring the feasibility of your, your product or service and then making a decision. So initially it's going to be pretty rough and ready. Once you go beyond that and you're looking for the banks or angel investors or venture capital funds to give you money, you have to have a proper accounting system, whether that be zero, mind your own business or any of the others that are out there. I'd certainly be looking for one of the good systems where you can tap in and have a look at what your cash flow is on a daily basis and make sure that things are right. Don't ever abdicate your responsibility around monitoring that cash flow and bringing the team together and talking about where you're at um, because that's where you can get into trouble. Once your expected sales are reaching 60,000, then you have to register for GST. Everything you sell unless it's exported is subject to GST. So that means 15% of your sale price is going off to the government immediately. Would you look at registering for GST earlier? Absolutely, because at the startup phase, 
you're likely to be spending more than what you're getting, uh, what you're uh, sending out there in the way of uh, sales. So, um, if you're buying equipment, things like that, and you know that you're going to be spending more than what your sales are, you want to claim the GST back on that. So it's worthwhile having a discussion with someone that knows about it and checking your logic and registering sooner rather than later. So the thing that often happens is people see the money in the bank account and forget that that money actually belongs to the government and they've only collected it on behalf of the government. It is not your money to use. You have to file your GST return and pay it. And if you're employing people, then you've got a responsibility to deduct and pay PAYE. And when you read the newspapers, there are lots of businesses who go to the wall because they've got PAYE they've collected off their employees and they don't pay it to the government. Um, it's actually a criminal offence and you will find that it's one of the worst things you can do is not pay PAYE to the government um, and you will be destroyed for it. So free thinking entrepreneurs, if you're surrounding yourself with them, they all want to be contractors. However, they have to truly be independent contractors and responsible, otherwise the tax office can come back to you and make you responsible for the tax that they should have paid. So be very careful, they need to be able to work their own hours, supply their own equipment, be able to work for other people, not just you, and every aspect of them has to be truly independent. They can't be running around with a business card that says managing director of X, Y, Z, when they're actually supposedly, for tax purposes, an independent contractor. So that's a word of warning, set it up properly from the beginning. When you've gotten to your first year of business, it's likely for 18 months you're going to lose money. And then things start to pick up and you make money. And what happens is that if you're in a business entity such as a company, that company is a separate person in its own right. So it has to pay its company tax, and that's 28%. And with that, you need to also pay tax in advance. So what you can do at the startup phase is actually opt to pay provisional tax at the same time as you're paying your GST. And that makes it, cash flow wise, a lot easier. The other trick with this is, instead of having your double whammy hit of um, provisional tax, actually make a payment out after balance date, and it has to be within 63 days, to pay shareholder salaries. And that can, I would make them subject to PAYE, so that you're actually paying the tax, you know, after balance date, you can manage the cash flow a bit better, even if you end up reinvesting that uh, cash all back in the company. So worthwhile again, getting your account sorted very soon after balance date, sitting down with someone who knows, let them make a recommendation as to how what is the best way to manage your cash flow. Because provisional tax is an awful trap when you end up having to pay essentially double the tax in one particular year and it puts uh, a lot of pressure on the cash flow of a business. People who give you advice that's really right out there, and this often appeals to entrepreneurs. You know, it's one way you can dodge your taxes for five years, or you can import goods through customs and put a different category onto goods um, and pay a lower tariff, or avoid your GST. And these things don't work and they're just a disaster waiting to happen. And so, you know, just be very, very careful. Stop and think beyond, this is exciting, this will save me money, and check in with someone else who's a bit more cautious 
to see what they say about it. Uh, there's, again, a lot of publicity in the papers about uh, customs recently closing down a business and putting it into liquidation. And it, they're looking to prosecute the owners. And that was a very good business. However, they got too smart for their own good and tried to rot the system just to save a bit of money and instead they've lost a whole lot. A question of do a health check and see whether something is actually makes sense in practice and if it's beyond your understanding when it comes to tariffs for customs or something else, then just check in with an expert because you'll be surprised, I think, to find that it's a two-minute question, someone will give that to you for free, and I can guarantee you know someone who knows someone who's in the industry and can actually uh, provide some help to you. I think different types of people have different risk profiles, and I think it's really important to understand your own risk profile. So I'm an accountant's daughter, so I have quite a um, a, you know, a low risk profile. I like to start things as cheaply as possible, get it to minimum viable product, um, and then if it works, I then invest more and more and more money. I've got friends who are entrepreneurs who are like, got this crazy idea, I'm gonna go borrow a million dollars and leverage everything and just go into it. So you need to kind of understand your um, propensity for risk as a person and then work in the field that works for you, would be my advice. So I feel very comfortable, um, and I, what I've discovered as well is I've got more and more attracted to risk as I've got more and more experienced at doing what I'm doing. Um, yeah, entrepreneurship is, is really fun, but I think we were talking before, it can be quite lonely. Um, your staff, you're never in the same space as your staff. You think you're going to be like a family, but it doesn't always work out like that. Um, so surrounding yourself with other like-minded people is probably the most important piece of advice I could. It's all about ROI, return on investment. So I've never been a design leader or the head or the director of this business to want pretty pictures. For me, fundamentally, it is about business. We are responsible to deliver a return to our clients. You need, you need money, so don't be naive, start your own business and say, you know, it's gonna be in profit from day one. There's, you know, there's very few businesses that are like that. Um, look, we we put all our own money into it and then some and our family's money you know that's how we got started so it's it's a nerve-wracking as jesse said it's a nerve-wracking road so don't start your own business unless you're prepared to put everything into it and if someone approaches us saying do you want to invest first question we ask is how much money have you put in yourself you know and if it's pretty if it's not kind of everything then you, you start to wonder why you'd be putting your money in if they're not prepared to put their own in so and, we, and Jeff's always said skin in the game as well, so from a staff perspective, um, you know, staff share schemes and, and having people fully invested in, in what you're uh, building in those sales figures and, uh, is, is really important. Yeah, but I guess the learning is you need capital. You know, the alternative was, um, you know, all that money we'd put in ourselves was going to disappear. And in the mentoring that we do, I, I so often hear people say the same thing, you know, um, someone wants to invest but I'm not prepared to give them this amount or this amount. And I remember Grant saying to you, it's better to have a small share of a large business and a big share of a small business. Yeah. yeah. The disconnect that we often see on investors versus, versus entrepreneurs is entrepreneurs love looking at their their, it's always through their business and their lens, yeah? You know, I got this cool thing, and we had this recently, we looked at a, it was a, it was a coffee shop business, and the coffee shop owner was trying to sell us, but all he could care was how amazing his service was, and how fabulous his coffee and his cakes tasted, and whereas all his you know, locations were all around town, and that was all that he cared about. Um, the investor, all he cared about was, uh, how much return was I gonna get from my $100,000 I put in, was my chance of getting my hundred thousand to three hundred thousand, or was he going to spank it away? And you know, just kind of like all kind of future. What was that? If I brought this, what could add on to gross my thing up to something way bigger? And the lens of an investor versus the passionate lens of an entrepreneur are completely different. And those two lenses have to gel somewhere if an investor is going to invest in a business. So the entrepreneur needs to think 
a bit more like the investor and vice versa. Yeah, or in, the, in, the, in that simpler ca in the case, if you're going, if the coffee shop's trying to sell it to an investor, his pitch deck has to be about how amazing his cakes and his coffee is. But he needs to have a good few pages on this is the payoff you're going to get, and this is where your money is going to be invested, and this is how it's going to grow, and just sort of like it can't all be about the the fun, passionate part of your business.